Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, the Tuesday edition, the legal edition, episode 332. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm Alan Haley. And today is October 10, 2017. Okay, I guess it's time to welcome you back from vacation. Uh, (laughs) There's been a lot going on in the world. I'd send Alan little IMs, hey, where are you? It'd be kind of cool to tape today. (laughs) There's some legal stuff we need to know about. And he's like, can't on the beach. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Oh, iPad fell out of hands, got too much suntan lotion on. Oh, I'm in an (laughs) RV in Minnesota. And I'm like, oh boy. And so I said, well, when you get back, email me. We got to talk. And so I got an email, and here we are talking about <laughs> what I did for summer vacation. What did Alan do for summer vacation? <laughs> well, my wife and I went to a family uh, wedding event back in uh, Milwaukee. Mm-hmm. And to get there, we drove our new uh, truck and Airstream RV. And you stayed in it all the way across and back. And then we went up to Minnesota, and we went to Illinois. Saw all parts of the country, including the huge, vast country in between the flyover countries they call it and when it's drive through country to, let me tell you kevin it's quite different uh for example you have to plan and find gas stations <laughs> yes you <I> do <laughs> but, well uh, I, I grew up in the land of ten thousand lakes that was that's my, uh, my home and yeah that there's just no such thing as um hopping in the car and going somewhere because that small farmer town down the road you're not sure if uh Willie's Gas and the Pub is really open. <laughs> See, right, right. Plan ahead. Well, it was beautiful country there. Uh, seeing Wisconsin, seeing uh, Minnesota, it was it was very beautiful and a nice time of year to be there. We had that perfect, glorious weather. Mm-hmm. Um, weather in California not good. Dry no. winds means fires. Exactly. Very low humidity right now, and the winds are coming from the east instead of from the west off the ocean. So they're not bringing any humidity with them, and uh, that makes everything like a tinderbox for fire easily to spread with high winds. And so you're seeing the he- headlines about all the properties have gone up in Napa and Sonoma, and then in my own uh, backyard here, we had two big serious fire- fires, one of which is still not under control, and burning into a gated residential area that has a lot of exclusive, uh, very wealthy homes. So it's uh, not a good time if you're in in the middle of the forested part of California. I heard your son had to evacuate. Yes, he had to evacuate his home. It's looking like it'll be safe because I think they stopped the progress of the fire just short of where his home is. So we're thankful for that. Uh, but he still can't move back. <laughs> a lot of the economy, at least in the last 40 years for California, has been wine. Um, how's the Napa Valley doing? The Napa Valley's getting, getting suffering some real tremendous losses here. and There's... Uh, I haven't seen a comprehensive list, but I think there's at least a dozen wineries, if not more, that have lost most of their inventory and or their vineyards. Uh, I have a cousin who lives on the, who grows and makes wine on the northern end of Napa toward Calistoga, and he seems barely to have escaped, but he's not sure about the wine he had to leave in his tanks outside. Uh, if the heat and the flames got to those, of course, that wine would be ruined. Yeah. Um, let's move on to some other news. and. You just wrote a story talking about South Carolina and what I want to call the good old boys club. Um, how judges, even though retired, will stand up Johnson. and uh, try and defend um, what is what I would call egregious justice. And yes. I think it's time to talk about that. Uh, because the diocese is trying to overcome this horrible ruling um, that threw out precedent, threw out law, throughout the fourth um, part of the Constitution uh, and all the other decisions in South Carolina, Indiana, you right. know, up to this point. And not only that, they did it with a, a total splintered vote. They couldn't even agree on a single approach uh, to the result that they, three of them came with out to. So it, it's really not even a valid legal decision as it, as it stands because the you don't have three justices agreeing on the same way to get to the result that they got there. And so you have three individual opinions of what should happen, which normally a court acts through the consensus of its justices. And there's no consensus here except between the two, uh, Placonis and uh, Kern. 
and um, yeah, Kay Hearn. Uh, Placonis and Kay Hearn are the ones who agreed on everything, concurred in each other's opinion, but they left the other three in the dust, and it was only because Chief Justice Beatty, using a totally different approach, uh, but said, okay, I can see here that there's a can Dennis Cannon Trust and that that therefore could not be revoked. So I will say the ones who signed on to the Dennis Cannon have to go. Well, that meant 29. It also did not mean, despite what he put in a footnote, that um, it was Camp Christopher because Camp Christopher is not subject to the Dennis Cannon. It's diocesan property. So his Dennis Cannon screening, you know, that's what this... <laughs> It's so infuriating, this decision. It's so illogical. Well, and yet they're pretending that it's like it's nothing. That uh, And now you have two retired judges of the appellate court uh, coming in to say nothing wrong with what Kay Hearn did here. She's a member of the Episcopal Church, and she awarded all this property to her own, own organization. But there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> so you're telling me the founders of this country who started the Constitution, started the, the law down the road, envisioned judges benefiting from their own decisions exactly when they have this degree of personal interest in it, they're supposed to withdraw mm -hmm. and uh the canons say that, i mean the judicial canons say they're supposed to withdraw and the statutes say they're supposed to withdraw but when they don't it's up it comes back to them for a decision oh well i i don't think i should withdraw well <laughs> i don't care about the integrity is what they're saying I don't care about it if it seems like that this is foul play going on because it's one of your own deciding to get that you get to keep what uh, you don't have. You get to take it from the other guy, which you don't didn't have to start with. So it's you know they'll all say, oh well, this was all the property of the Episcopal Church ever since, but not true in South Carolina. All of the parishes, most of the parishes affected in this case predate the Episcopal Church and the founding of the Episcopal Church. So it's the worst kind of you know shilly-shallying to try to say that this was all their property and it was all in trust for them all along. They haven't even got the people to put in these churches. They haven't got the money to maintain it. And so it's crazy. And it's going um, to change hands because of a stupid decision that doesn't even matter, uh, come to a consensus. I, this is absolutely the worst possible kind of thing, situation I could imagine in the civil law. In, in, and uh, In law, I have to agree with you. I, I and I'm not a lawyer person at all, but uh, <laughs> I've watched a lot of CSI in my day, and a lot of <laughs> yeah. law and order. And uh, this this wouldn't even make the fiction part. You know, they they no. couldn't write something like this and make it believable. Why have a Supreme Court when it's not supreme? That's right. Okay, this uh, is not a Supreme Court. <laughs> so one judge is benefiting uh, to the tune of about five hundred million dollars. Oh yeah, well, that's another little qualm. They they say, oh well, you know, she's not really benefiting because her parish, St. Anne's, uh, long ago said, no, we don't want the property of St. Paul's. Well, tell that to Justice Hearn. In her opinion, she said, for my sake, all properties, including the ones that didn't sign on to the Dennis Cannon, like St. Paul's, should be the property of the Episcopal Church in South Carolina. So they're disclaiming it as a parish, but she's not wanting to give it away. She wants her own organization to have their property too. So it's ridiculous to say that uh, she's not biased on that ground. All right, well, let's talk some technical uh, issues here. After mm -hmm. the decision came down, um, the diocese says we want a rehearing. We want to uh, let you know that if you haven't figured it out yet, it's a bad decision. Um, here's <laughs> why. How successful or likely will they be with a rehearing? Well, the first issue on the rehearing is who should sit on that uh, petition and decide it. Mm -hmm. Uh, should Justice Hearn continue to sit on it? In other words, she's been biased and, and violating the judicial canons all along, so shall we continue to let her do so? Uh, is that the reason that you, you would allow her to decide it? So the first issue that has to be reached by this uh, Supreme Court, so-called, of South Carolina, is whether Justice Hearn should be disqualified from acting on the petition for rehearing. Now, that sets up a possible problem, because say they say some sort of you know Christian light comes in on her and she says gee I really shouldn't be deciding this okay so I'm gonna withdraw that leaves a panel of four uh, justices uh, three of whom are retired now two of them are, are retired and it could go two to two in which case that would be an automatic denial of the petition for rehearing but that's unfair um, because you need a panel of five to make a decision so it won't come out with a tie 
And so they're going to have to, in that case, um, if it does turn out to be two to two, it's going to, they're going to have to find a fifth justice who will cast the deciding vote. And hopefully this one will be impartial, but there's no guarantee of that at all. So that's, um, that's the first hurdle in this petition. So for the first hurdle is a catch 22. Correct. If she steps down, now, you lose. Well, if she steps down, it becomes more difficult. But at the same time, uh, if the rehearing is granted, then all the problems go away. The the opinions are essentially uh, can be altered and vacated and whatever they want to them if the petition for rehearing is granted and they take a fresh look at it. So there, there's lots of problems with the decision, as I put up in a series of posts on my blog, that the, the merits of the decision, because you don't have three justices in any uh, group all agreeing on the same thing. So they really ought to correct that and reason their way through to a, a true decision that's based on consensus in the law. Now, they, and, they can't say, well, we know we screwed up. We're going to reissue another opinion. That's they how, can do that. They can do that. Oh, they can do that. Exactly. I like that. Yeah. So that is a, that's a path that's open to them to say, we're really sorry we put this mess out for you. And let's, let's get it straight and reason it right and, and come out with a reasoned opinion that everybody can defend. And so that would be one hope. Um, but if it doesn't happen, if they vote to deny the petition for rehearing, if, if Justice Hearn stays on, for example, and the vote is three to two to deny it, uh, or if it's two to two and it, it automatically is deemed denied without a fifth justice participating, then the only remedy left is to take this up to the U.S. Supreme Court and say, please, U.S. Supreme Court, don't let this travesty stand. This is a crazy uh, a result to have happened based on such outlandish and biased reasoning. Now, you and I have been in this type of situation before. We've right. talked about how often the Supreme Court takes up church property cases. Right. When is the last time they even looked at a case? <laughs> well, the last time they looked at a church property case was 1979. Uh, the, all the ones that have come up since then with the recent disputes with the Episcopal Church from California, from Georgia, from Connecticut um, and um, Fort Worth, they, they all refused to take a look at those cases. There were various parties wanting to, even the Episcopal Church was asking for review in, in one case, and uh, the Supreme Court said, no, don't need it. But they're starting to have to recognize that the mess that has been made by Jones v. Wolf and the opinion that it, with its language saying that uh, it would be a minimal burden on, on the national church if it amended its constitution to include a trust provision. Um, in this case, of course, the Episcopal Church didn't follow that. Uh, they put the trust in their canons and not in their constitution. But the, many of the courts have said it doesn't matter whether it's canons or not. They don't recognize the difference between a constitution, which it would have taken the Episcopal Church four years to amend, uh, and it would have had to have the concurrence of all the dioceses versus a canon that's passed on the last split second of the last day of the general convention, never publicized or announced for over 20 years until all of a sudden it springs in on everyone as though it's it's been there all the time. And uh, the courts just say, hey, it's been there long enough. You didn't do anything about it. So, <laughs> And that's the difficulty. Um, to this that's, date, I've been covering Anglican News uh, 10 years. Nobody I, has ever provided me with detailed information about the passage of the Dennis Cannon. All the records are missing. Uh, all the crucial records are missing. And but the courts, as I say, they're civil courts. They're not equipped to understand or address these um, ecclesiastical type of issues. And they say, hey, you made it. You live with it. Um, but even that said, I mean, if they can read the canon, what it says, it says it puts a property in trust. Well, that isn't the way you create a trust under state law. Uh, to get a trust on state law, it has to be the owner of the property signing the document, putting in trust, not the beneficiary who says, oh, your house is in trust for me. Uh, they can't, you can't create a trust that way. And yet all these courts are allowing the Episcopal Church to do just that. And that, I submit, is an establishment of the Episcopal Church. It's giving it a favorite role that they don't give to other civil people who have to create trusts the normal way. And it's all because of this language about a minimal burden appearing in Jones v. Wolf. So the Supreme Court owns this problem. They own it in spades, and it's up to them if they're going to do something about it. They, it's high time they start doing something about clarifying what they meant, because they cannot, even the Supreme Court of the United States could not interpret 
the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution to say the Episcopal Church gets a pass when it comes to creating a national trust on all its property. So, uh, that would be a violation of the First Amendment in and of itself. Suppose a non-religious entity, the Girl Scouts, um, Alcoholics Anonymous, had in their uh, canons, um, I guess they wouldn't have canons, uh, in their constitution, in their bylaws, in their yeah. bylaws, that any church that they have a median in, they own. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm sure uh, every uh, state court and obviously the U.S. Supreme Court would be interested in making sure they got that one right. Yeah. Yeah, you would think so. Uh, on the other hand, uh, anything seems to be possible now with the courts. I'm, I've stopped trying to predict what can come out because it's I, it's the only safe prediction is that they'll make a mess of it. So you do see... Yeah, whether it's encouraging or discouraging, there is a way forward in South Carolina if uh, things happen in, in a certain way. Right. They haven't lost all their options yet, but the th most important thing to see will be whether these judges circle the wagons for each other or whether they truly look, stand back and look at the terrible situation they've created with such awful and poor and biased reasoning. Uh, and say, you know, this isn't right. We have to fix this. This is not something we can uh, hold up our heads about. Our integrity is shot here. Let's uh, regroup and make this right. Now, if they can do that, then there will be hope for things. But if they can't do it, why then, it, as I say, what's the point of having a Supreme Court? Did you get a chance to watch my interview with uh, uh, Jim Lewis? Uh, yes, I did. Okay. Um, he just posted a couple of days ago that they're going to be into mediation. Yes. Uh, is that for this case or the other case? It's for all the cases. All the There's cases. There's a federal case and the state case, yeah. How will that work? Uh, well, it'll all depend on the strength of the mediator. He's a retired, he's a sitting federal judge, and so he should have some skill in this. Well, and... hold on. Is he Episcopalian? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask the obvious least, question before I go through right. that. I mean, the stress in my heart the last two years over this case is just <laughs> a little, a little, least, a little dicey. At least I have not seen a report that he is, but okay. uh, that would be truly discouraging if he turned out to be. Mm -hmm. uh, in any event, the yeah. So he will call the parties together. He'll listen to the arguments on both sides, and he'll try to point out, for example, to the uh, Episcopal church in South Carolina, the 815 group, that um, they could lose. They could either, you know, have the South Carolina Supreme Court agree to reverse itself, or the U.S. Supreme Court could agree to take the case. And he'll say, you know, you guys really have to be reasonable. You can't have all these properties. You can't use all the properties. So what are you willing to, how are you willing to compromise? And to Bishop Lawrence and his group, he'll, he'll say the opposite, saying, you know, you've already lost everything, <clears throat> and that result might stand. So if you get something back and we get this uh, get together here, what is it minimally that you need to survive as your church and keep going forward that you can put on the table to offer? So he'll try to get the parties to agree on some sort of compromise of division of assets and property in which the probably the big fight will be the name and the uh, corporate's insignia because mm -hmm. those have belonged with uh, Bishop Lawrence's diocese for over 200 years and um, I don't see those being given up that early but that's the problem of a mediator he can't impose a decision he can just try to recommend and get people to see the good sense of going this way rather than taking their chances in such a crazy court system. Well, I think we threw good sense out a long time ago, Alan. I'm yeah. sorry. But... <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, as according to St. Paul, you have Christians throw out good sense when they take anything to a civil court yeah. <laughs> instead of resolving a dispute between themselves as Christians. Uh... And, that you know, there couldn't be truer advice. I just keep coming back to that every time. Um, I have nothing I can add to it, and this just... I get more and more examples that prove it every day about how. Well, if, if, if this case proves two things. One, you never go to court. Two, right. you always seek um, that a person who has conflicting interest, a judge, steps down. You know, right. don't, don't second guess it. Make it public. Right. Or just go, you know, especially when they, they would benefit 500 million bucks, yeah. you know, all the way to the wall. I, I'm going to be very loud about this. You need to step down. Yeah. Um, that that would be that, my, my opinion, of course. 
And this will become known, if this result stands, it will be the, de the decision that was won by cheating. Mm -hmm. they, had a, they had a ringer on the court for them who cast the deciding vote. So we'll have to start referring to, just calling it for what it is, it's, it's winning by cheating. Well, this isn't the first time cheating has been employed by the Episcopal Church. I would like to remind you, specifically, <laughs> uh, you, you may remember this, you are in California and you sat through these uh, hearings. Um, mm -hmm. The Episcopal Church never let you go to trial over the property issues um, with Long Beach and uh, the other churches. They would never right. let you go before a judge to go to trial. Right. And That's uh, cheating. There were... Well, and, and also because it was, again, it was so one-sided in the way that uh, they came at things with their arguments about we're the supreme, um, you know, ch hierarchical church. And they keep throwing that word out, which is a 19th century word and no longer applies in our world of neutral principles. But they just keep throwing it out there and justices pick up on it and say, well, here's an easy way to solve it. It's the, whatever the Episcopal Church says is what goes. And California long ago drank that Kool-Aid and there's enough precedent now in the books so they can just say to any California court, well, here, look at this court, this court, and the California Supreme Court. So it's a dead issue here to try to argue the Episcopal Church isn't hierarchical, quote unquote. It, it's a meaningless word, as I say, because it's anything but hierarchical, as you and I know. Sure. Well, I, I do remember <coughs> the, the late 80s and early 90s when the Roman Catholic Church was going to go through their lawsuits over uh, their trouble with uh, some pedophile priest. They, mm -hmm. you know, probably the most uh, hierarchical church outside of the um, Orthodox Church on record quickly said, what do you mean? We're not hierarchical. No, <laughs> you guys are right. being silly. You, do, you, you don't even put that in a legal document. We are not hierarchical. Um, and the, the Episcopal Church is doing the opposite, um, despite, you know, on paper, they should not right. be able to. Yeah. And as I say, it's a, it's a, it's a buzzword that just uh, makes it easy for the courts to go off in a wrong direction. And that's what they found. It's, you know, it's funny because I, I heard the talk given by uh, presiding Bishop Curry on leaving the recent GAFCON conference to the Episcopal Church. And he boasted and bragged about how brotherly and in Christ they all were as they met together, called it a holy meeting, and said that uh, they discussed how to disagree, but they were going to go forward and talk about, uh, you know, get the word of Jesus Christ out to the rest of the world. The word of Jesus Christ, of course, as interpreted by the Episcopal Church. And you know, it's kind of like, if you want an analogy, I think now the Episcopal Church wraps itself in the cloak of Jesus Christ instead of holding out the lantern of Jesus Christ. The lantern is the light, the cloak hides the light and, the, and, what, and tries to make it seem what it is, uh, is, is not. And so that way they manage to twist things around. And I think I'm going to have to use that analogy in some future post. <laughs> oh, definitely. I mean, and here's how I see it. The Episcopal <laughs> Church's Jesus is the, the magnum social justice warrior of all time. <laughs> For most Anglicans around the world, he's uh, Lord and Savior. A little different. Right. Um, and uh, one is to redeem the world. One is to redeem mankind. And uh, we'll have to see how this ends. But I, I, I listened to Presiding Bishop Curry's uh, talk, too, and I'm like, Wow, we are worlds apart. Worlds yeah, it's apart. Walking apart and pretending to be together. It just mm -hmm. is not a recipe for you know, winning people to Christ. Mm -hmm. Alan, I want to thank you for your time. Um, I'm expecting the next big announcement uh, from South Carolina, Texas, and all that on the date you depart for your next vacation. <laughs> next When's vacation. that going to be? <laughs> That's going to be in November. <laughs> You have yeah. an amazing ability to, to leave at the time of need for Anglican Unscripted viewers. But all right, so we'll, we'll be watching the news in November. Alan, thank you for your time. I'm Kevin Coulson. Okay. And I'm Alan Haley. And this has been episode 332 of Anglican Unscripted.